Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to our second quarter webcast. I'm Marie Kling, a partner in our global accounting team. Today I'm joined by my fellow partners from the global team, Gary Berkowitz, Paul Shepard, and Scott Bandura. In this webcast, we'll focus on some topical issues. We'll start with cash flow statement presentation and some common issues we've seen there. We'll then move on to global minimum taxes. We'll discuss the application of hyperinflationary accounting. We'll then move on to some key issues and reminders relating to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We'll also provide an ESG update and we'll finish off with an ISV update. Please feel free to use the timestamps in the description below the video if you want to go straight to one of the topics we're discussing today. Now, please note that this content is for general information purposes, and it is not a substitute for consultation with professional advisors. Right, I7, Statement of Cash Flows. Now, I7 is quite an old standard uh, without much detailed guidance. And since it was issued many years ago, transactions and businesses have evolved quite a lot. And as a result, when preparing the statement of cash flows, it's often not straightforward and mistakes can be made. And that's why today we'd like to talk about some common mistakes that we've seen and that folks should look out for when you are next preparing your statement of cash flows. So let's start by talking about the classification of cash flows relating to leases in the lessors cash flow statement. And I think this is often a tricky uh, scenario because you have one part of I-7 that tells you the acquisition and disposal of long-term assets is an investing cash flow. And you have another part of I-7 that tells you if, um, uh, if, if, your if something is a principal revenue generating activity, it should be an operating cash flow. And so sometimes it can be really tricky for lessors who have um, leasing as their primary business to work out whether or not the inflows and outflows relating to their leases are operating or investing uh, cash flows. And so I think sometimes it might be helpful to think of it in the following way, which is your general rule is when you acquire or sell a long-term asset, it's an investing cash flow, but you need to also then overlay that by thinking, what is my business model? If my business model is something very specific, so it's the manufacturer or acquisition of long-term assets with a plan to either sell them straight away via finance lease or rent them and then routinely sell them thereafter, you have a very specialized business model which effectively overrides the, the general principle of it should be an investing cash inflow or outflow. And if you just think of two examples where this might be the case, you have a real estate entity that acquires real estate and then leases it out on a, an indefinite basis. When it acquires that real estate, that is the acquisition of a long-term asset. Is its business model to sell it or rent and then sell? No. And as a result, the acquisition of that real estate will typically be an investing cash outflow. And then the lease rentals that it receives in the future would be operating cash inflows because it's not the disposal of that long-term asset. If you think however, about a manufacturing lessor, a manufacturing lessor effectively manufactures the asset with a business model to sell it via a finance lease in the future, if that is the case, I7 would say, no, no, the cash outflows relating to that are actually operating as well as the subsequent cash inflows. So I think it's fair to say that there's no hard and fast rules here, but it's worth acknowledging the conflict or contradiction in I7 and thinking really carefully about your facts and circumstances, your business model, and the way in which you monetize those assets. Right, so let's briefly have a look at um, some other common mistakes that are on the next slide. The first one there is payments to acquire an additional non-controlling interest or NCI. Now these are financing cash outflows. I know sometimes folks classify them as investing. And another common mistake we see sometimes here is the settlement of a share-based payment where the entity expends cash to buy the shares to give to its employees. And a lot of the times folks naturally think, well, that must be an operating cash outflow because I'm paying an employee cost but the acquisition of the shares continues to be a financing cash outflow, so watch out for that one. Um, there, in the next one, we've got contingent consideration payments and related to an acquisition. Uh, we intended to tick all three of those. Yes, it could be operating, investing, or financing, depending on the nature of the contingent consideration and also the movement of the uh, final payment relative to what was initially recognized. So just watch out for that one, and it's worth, worth a bit of detailed analysis. Uh, transaction costs relating to an acquisition, a lot of the time folks think that is an investing cash flow because it's linked to buying a business. 
um, but it actually needs to be classified as an operating cash flow because you don't get to recognize any kind of asset related to those acquisition costs. And so there is a rule in IS7. Uh, cash inflows from government grants that could be operating or investing depending on the nature of the government grant and what it's intended to compensate the entity for. So again, understanding the nature of that government grant is important. Uh, the next one there is cash flows relating to the disposal of a subsidiary. We've got that as investing, and the important thing there is that that is the aggregates or net cash flows on the disposal of the subsidiary. So the cash inflow you get um, minus the cash that was in the subsidiary that you lose, the net amount needs to be recognized as an, hopefully a, a net inflow um, uh, investing activity. Um, then on the next slide, we have uh, interest received. Now, again, there's a policy choice here under IS7. Um, clearly, you can show interest received as either operating or investing. And the point here is be consistent with how you've chosen your accounting policy and a similar policy choice exists for interest paid. Capitalized borrowing costs, again, that could be either operating or investing, depending on the nature of the asset that the um, interest was capitalized into. So if you capitalize interest into inventory, it will be operating. If you capitalize the interest into an item of PPE that you're building, it will be classified as investing. Um, management remuneration rather than consideration for an acquisition. So in a business combination, just be careful if some of the um, consideration paid is deemed to be compensation rather than consideration for the acquisition. The cash flow statement similarly needs to be consistent with that and recognize that portion of the uh, payments out as an operating cash payment out because you're paying for employee services, presumably. And supplier finance arrangements there, um, we, we've, done, we've done a whole webcast on supplier finance arrangements. It wouldn't be complete if we didn't talk about them again. But just remember from a cash flow perspective, um, if you gross up your um, cash flow statement for the supplier financing arrangement, you will naturally get a, a financing and an operating um, cash flow. If you, however, have determined there's only one net cash flow in a supplier finance arrangement, the final payment that you make to the bank, that can either be classified as operating or financing depending on the nature of the supply arrangement. And if it's material, it might make sense to be clear how that has been classified and why. And those hopefully are common pitfalls that folks can avoid then moving forward. So um, some folks may have heard about the Global Minimum Taxes Initiative, the OECD Pillar 2 Rules or Globe Rules or some other name, but let's just briefly go through what actually happened, um, what this means, and talk about some of the accounting. So first of all, maybe a bit of background, who are the OECD? So the OECD are the Organization for Economic uh, Cooperation and Development. And they're basically an NGO that works with um, governments to try and find global solutions to, to problems to basically make the world a better place. Um, it's made up of 37 member countries and five key partners, and together they represent a substantial part of the global GDP. So what happened? Um, back in November 2021, 137 countries signed up or joined the, a two-pillar plan to reform international taxes and I'll get on to, to what that means. Um, and what are the benefits? I think they estimated at the time of agreeing to this that uh, if everyone signs up to these new rules, it'll generate approximately $150 billion in additional tax revenues on an annual basis. So what are the Pillar 2 rules and how are they intended to work? So in terms of the scope of the rules, there's Pillar 1, but we're focusing on Pillar 2. <clears throat> and Pillar 2 affects most multinationals with global turnover of above 750 million euros. Now, I think what's really important to understand here is that, as I said, the OECD is a non-for-profit organization, and so they cannot mandate that, that uh, countries implement these rules. Obviously, that's a, a, a legal local legislation issue. But if countries, because they all did sign up to it, if they choose and when they choose to implement, they should follow the framework that was developed. And what is the overall design of the Pillar 2 rules? Well, the Objective here is to establish a minimum amount of tax, um, and that is 15% that is paid at a jurisdictional level. So we've got an example coming in the next couple of slides that will hopefully bring this to light. But the idea is that if you don't pay a, that minimum of 15% in the jurisdictions and you operate on your net profit, then there will be a top up um, and you will be required to pay until your effective tax rate in all those jurisdictions is effectively 15%. And there are two mechanisms that basically make up the policy rules. The first is the income inclusion rule. 
and this is the primary rule that takes precedence over the, the under tax payment rule, which I'll talk about in a second. But the point there is that's payable in the ultimate parent jurisdiction. Um, again, it'll come to light with some numbers, but the point being, if the parent has adopted the, um, the uh, pillar two rules uh, and one of its uh, jurisdictions is paying not enough tax, the taxing authority in the parent will actually have the ability to, to levy a, additional tax on the parent um, such that it effectively pays the 15% in the low tax paying jurisdiction. Now, in terms of timing on the IRR, the OECD framework proposed that it should become effective um, from 1 January 2023 onwards. But as I mentioned, it will really depend on when each individual territory implements the tax rules um, from a local legislation perspective. At this point in time, the, the EU is planning to implement um, or make it effective in, uh, from 1 December 2023. But again, these rules are very complex and they're moving targets. So even by the time this is uh, this is uh, this podcast or webcast comes out, this might change. Uh, and then, then there's the undertaxed payment rule. What is this? This is really just a backstop in case IRR doesn't capture the under under um, under under payment of tax. So in other words, if your parent wasn't applying the pillar two rules and therefore there wasn't a mechanism to tax the jurisdiction that was paying a relatively low portion of tax, the UTPR um, gives the ability to reallocate the taxing rights to other entities in the group provided they have adopted the pillar two rules. And because this is more complicated, the OECD framework suggested that that comes into effect on 1 Jan 2024. And again, at this point in time, the EU is planning on making it uh, effective from 31 December 2024 onwards. Okay, so as I mentioned, let's go to a simple example on the next slide, which um, hopefully brings us to life a little bit more with numbers. So let's assume in our situation, we have a parent who has a um, consolidated profit before tax of £2,300. Um, so let's, I guess, assume we're in the UK uh, and they have a consolidated tax expense of 240 And I think what's important here is that the pillar two rules are initially keyed off of your um, IFRS consolidated earnings or your local gap earnings if you're not applying IFRS. And then there's various uh, complicated adjustments. But for purposes of this simple example, we're going to stick to that there are, are no adjustments. Um, so that's the, and, and you'll see that in the numbers, we've got the parents' income and all of the subsidiaries that make up that consolidated income of £2,300. So in jurisdiction one, the parents' jurisdiction, it's an operating company, it's got a profit before tax of 100, its tax expense is £25, effective tax rate 25, no problem. In jurisdiction two, which is the country, you look at the combined uh, profit before tax of the entities in that jurisdiction, that is 700. Their combined uh, tax expense for that jurisdiction is 140. You have a consolidated effective tax rate in that jurisdiction of 20%. Again, 20% is greater than the 15% minimum. There would be no problem in jurisdiction two. Then we get to jurisdiction three though, and they are a relatively low tax rate jurisdiction. It says 5%. The consolidated profit before tax for the entities in jurisdiction three is £1,500. The consolidated tax expense is 75. Therefore, their effective tax rates in jurisdiction three is only 5%. 5% is less than 15. That's the easy part. And therefore, the IRR, or the top-up tax, would kick in. Uh, how would it calculate it? It would say, okay, you've underpaid your effective tax rate by 10%. We multiply that by the eligible tax. Again, in our very simple example, it's 1,500. Um, in the real world, it would be, it would, you, there's different deductions and different uh, adjustments, but you therefore pay an additional 10% on that 1,500 profit before tax in jurisdiction three, resulting in an additional top-up tax of 150, which as I mentioned before, would actually be levied at the parent entity jurisdiction. And so what you'll see, you'll end up, uh, clearly you can see from that, that it's in a tax authority's best interests to actually increase their own minimum tax in their jurisdiction, um, because if they don't, as in this example, the tax is going to be paid. It's just which tax entity or which tax fiscus um, obtains that. Is it jurisdiction one or jurisdiction three? And so in advance of, of pillar two coming out, you might see a lot of domestic taxes changing um, in relatively low tax jurisdictions to try and ensure that if there is going to be an increase in tax, it's actually the jurisdiction in which the income is earned that is um, obtaining that tax revenue rather than uh, a parent entity or another entity in the group. So let's talk about some of the accounting implications under IFRS. And I think it's fair to say um, 
the rules are still relatively new and they are very, very complex. And as a result, um, the accounting is going to be complex as well. And we are at um, the early stages of working out what that accounting may be. But I think a couple of questions that we are currently thinking about. The first is whether or not this tax is in the scope of IS-12. I think for the IRR, we are tentatively comfortable that it is a tax in the scope of IS-12. For UTPR, it's maybe a little bit more questionable because although the determination of UTPR is on the same basis, um, when you reallocate that tax uh, to other entities in the group, it's done on a, um, an employee and an asset-based perspective. And as a result, it's questionable whether or not that still means it's in the scope of IS-12. I think, again, tentatively at this stage, we still think that UTPR will also be in the scope of, of IS-12. I guess another question then is, is if it is in the scope of IS-12, should you be calculating deferred tax on the uh, entities that may be affected by the GLOBE 2 rules? This is a really tricky question, um, made more so because of all the uncertainties around when and how the tax will reverse in the future, and also by virtue of the fact that your temporary differences in some cases will not have an impact um, on the amount of future tax you pay in a low tax jurisdiction. So uh, still discussing this one, a very hot topic at this point in time, and hopefully by um, the next webcast, we'll have a more definitive answer for you on that one. I guess the more key question at this point in time then is disclosure, because as I mentioned, we're not aware of any uh, territory that has uh, adopted these rules in 2022. Um, for example, the EU plans to adopt only in 2023, as well as the UK. But I guess there's a question, well, then in 2022, what should you be doing? Because it may be that it only becomes effective in 2023, but you may be in a jurisdiction where it's been substantively enacted in 2022, or you may be in a situation where it is substantively enacted in 2023. It's only effective at a later point in time, but you're still within your period of post balance sheet events before the finalization of your 2022 accounts. So I guess from a disclosure perspective, it, it will depend on where your jurisdiction is from a implementation of the rules perspective. Have they implemented and are they effective? I would be surprised if that was the case. Have they possibly um, implemented, but it's not yet effective, in which case it's been substantively enacted? Or is it very close to being substantively enacted, but it hasn't been at the time of your financials? And I think the key point here is to give users of the financials useful information to the extent that you think these pillar two rules are going to have a material impact um, on your consolidated group. In 2022, the list of hyperinflation territories uh, expanded to include, unfortunately, uh, Turkey and Ethiopia. Uh, so entities with a currency of uh, Turkish lira should start to apply IS-29 from June 2022 onwards and for Ethiopia in the second half of 2022. Now, folks might recall that hyperinflation accounting should be applied as if the economy had always been hyperinflationary. And as a result, the application of IS-29 is complicated. It requires a lot of restatement procedures. And so we thought it might make sense to remind folks of some of the key, key requirements. So the first is selection of the general price index. And that is important because obviously one of the key aspects of IS-29 is the requirement to index up all of your non-monetary um, assets. And all entities that report in the currency should use um, the same index and should do it as if the economy had always been hyperinflationary, as I mentioned. Now, we believe that the consumer price index is the most reliable indicator of changes in general price levels because it's normally closest to the concept of a, a general price index that's required by IS-29. So look for CPR in your territory, I guess, is the, is the, key, the key point there. Now, entities that have subsidiaries with uh, hyperinflation currency as their functional currency should remember that there are some key differences between the accounting by the parent and the subsidiary. Remember that the, the current year financial position and results of the subsidiary are restated in accordance with IS-29 before they're included in the consolidated financial statements. And remember that when you include that foreign subsidiary in your consolidated financial statements, you need to use the closing rate for both the balance sheet and the income statement. And the subsidiary comparatives are also not restated in the parent's consolidated financial statements, where in the subsidiary's own consolidated financial statements, they will restate their comparatives in accordance with IS-29. And the third thing is folks may be aware that recently the IFRS Interpretations Committee received a submission 
on how a parent with a functional and presentation currency that's hyperinflationary should consolidate and present a subsidiary that has a functional currency that's not hyperinflationary. So this would be if you are a parent in Turkey, um, but you have an operation in somewhere in, um, in the EU. And so the committee um, is currently in the process of analyzing that fact pattern. Uh, we currently have guidance on that in on viewpoint and in our manual of accounting and believe that the policy choice is acceptable, but we'll keep you updated on where the committee gets to on that. So yeah, more guidance on the application of IS-29 is available on viewpoints and included in our PwC manual of accounting. Let's move on to key reminders and considerations related to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Now, in addition to the severe humanitarian impact caused by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the imposition of international sanctions has had a pervasive economic impact globally. It's important for reporting entities to recognize the significance of the impact on the business environment, liquidity, and asset values. Global businesses might be severely impacted by supply chain disruption, market volatility, payment risk, and increasing commodity costs resulting from the invasion. We've published an in-depth covering these accounting implications for financial statements for periods ending on or after March 31st, 2022. The in-depth is available on Viewpoint, and we are in the process of updating it for any new issues that are relevant to June 30 period ends. Today, what I wanted to do is provide a high-level overview of the key matters to consider. Let me start with interim financial statements. Now, one of the key principles for interim financial information is that it usually updates the information provided in the annual financial statements. So as a result, for entities with significant exposures to Russia or Ukraine's markets, the invasion will likely constitute a significant event in terms of IS-34, the interim um, reporting standard. Those entities might therefore adjust or even potentially expand the level of detail of the information provided in their interim financial statements. For example, by providing a breakdown of assets and liabilities that are potentially exposed to Russia's invasion of Ukraine into the sanctions. Some of the disclosures are normally required by individual standards for a complete set of annual financial statements may be necessary in those interim financial statements. So let me move on to the general disclosure requirements. Entities with exposure in the markets affected by the invasion should either explain the impact of the invasion or explain why the invasion has not had a material impact on these financial statements, despite the exposure to significant risks. Entities should also update the disclosures relating to the sensitivity analyses, for example, by expanding the range of reasonably possible changes in key assumptions or reassessing assumptions used. Entities should also consider potential implication of the invasion and the measures taken in response to it when assessing an entity's ability to continue as a going concern. Material uncertainties that might cast significant doubt on an entity's ability to continue as a going concern should be disclosed in accordance with IS-1. Finally, there should be consistency between the information disclosed in the financial statements and reported elsewhere, for example, in management reports. Now let's move on to another topic um, of significance, and that is a topic of control. Now restrictions have been imposed by governments on Russia and certain individuals, Russian individuals and entities, and also by the Russian government. Now government restrictions that are imposed include the ban by the Central Bank of Russia on payment of dividends um, to international investors and international sanctions, which impact an entity's ability to trade with or remit profits from Russia. An investor is required to consider changes that are affecting its exposure or its rights to variable returns from its involvement with an investee in Russia. For example, an investor that has power over an investee can lose control over an investee if the investor ceases to be exposed or have rights to those variable returns. However, government imposed sanctions over the repatriation of funds in isolation is unlikely to mean an investor is no longer exposed to variable returns. The investor may still be exposed to those variable returns, despite uncertainty as to how or when the investor can realize the returns. It's therefore necessary that each situation is addressed on its individual merits, taking into account all of the relevant facts and circumstances. Now, additionally, a growing number of multinational entities have decided to withdraw from business interests they have in Russia. As part of that process, they may remove themselves from the board of directors. The impact of these decisions will also need to be considered. Even though uh, a multinational entity may have elected to remove its directors from the board, 
it may still continue to have the legal right to reappoint directors. The removal of directors by the entity, again on its own, is therefore unlikely to result in the entity losing power over a Russian entity. Disclosures there will therefore be important, particularly around any changes made to the assessment of control, as well as any significant judgment and assumptions. In addition, disclosures around significant restrictions on an entity's ability to access or use the assets and settle the liabilities of the group should also be considered. Now, another hot topic is relating to assets held for sale. Now, actions related to discontinuing operations in Russia may trigger non-current assets held for sale considerations. So if companies are unable to sell a business or specific assets due to sanction restrictions, entities should consider if these assets will rather be abandoned. Assets or disposal groups that are to be abandoned shall not be classified as held for sale. However, results in cash flows from a disposal group that is to be abandoned shall be presented as discontinued operations at the date on which it ceases to be used if the specific criteria in IFRS 5 are met. Now let's talk about impairment and let me start with impairment of non-financial assets. Obviously impairment is also a key consideration. So entities need to carefully consider whether the effect of the invasion, direct or indirect, constitutes an indication that one or more assets may be impaired. Plans to dispose of or abandon operation because of the invasion could also trigger an impairment of asset. An expected cash flow approach might be a better way to estimate a recoverable amount than a single predicted outcome in order to capture the increased risk and uncertainty in those cash flows. So there may be a range of potential outcomes considering different scenarios. The critical impairment disclosures that will be of particular interest to the users of the financial statements for this upcoming reporting cycle will likely be related to sensitivity analyses. Key assumptions should not be restricted to discount rate or growth rates, but it may also include expected profit margin or other highly sensitive assumptions that could have a significant impact on those future cash flows. Now, fair value considerations are also important. So let me move on to some financial instruments related issues, starting off with fair value considerations for equity securities issued by Russian entities. Now, many exchanges, such as the New York Stock Exchange or the London Stock Exchange, have suspended trading from any, from many entities that had been dual listed on these exchanges, as well as the Moscow Stock Exchange. Now, for non-Russian market participants holding Russian equities that are subject to Russian sanctions, there is no access to active markets to trade equity securities issued by Russian entities. Now, we view this more as a structural market issue rather than an entity-specific restriction. So where access to an active market is unavailable, the entity would need to use a valuation technique that maximizes the use of observable inputs. Now, although the price on the Moscow Stock Exchange will not be considered a level one input for those entities that cannot access the Moscow Stock Exchange, the trading price will qualify as an observable input to the extent that trading is occurring on the Moscow Stock Exchange. Now, valuation models should also include other inputs necessary to reflect the value that the entity could realize from selling such securities to a hypothetical market participant, and should also consider the probability of sanctions um, being lifted in the future or other possible means of transacting it's in such securities, such as a total return swap or a derivative transaction, where that, of course, is legally possible. Now, let's move on to fair value uh, for debt instruments. So, Similar to equity um, securities, um, we also got questions around fair valuing debt instruments. So in, in a similar vein, one must consider the implications of the sanctions on the fair value measurement, uh, for example, of Russian bonds. So the definition of fair value includes an orderly transaction between market participants. Now, in the absence of market-based pricing, there is a significant focus on the determination of the appropriate market participants with whom the company would transact. Now, the scale of the global sanctions issued after the invasion means that the historically applied perspectives may no longer be valid. As such, historical assumptions need to be revisited. Management will have to assess who the relevant market participants currently are and how that may affect the price or other aspects of determining fair value. Let's move on to impairments. Um, so additional expected credit loss considerations may be triggered by the invasion and are relevant for those financial instruments that are not carried at fair value for profit and loss. 
Those considerations include whether there has been a significant increase in credit risk. Additionally, the measurement of expected credit losses, which takes account for looking information, may also be impacted. It may be necessary to perform the assessment on a collective basis where the effects cannot be identified in the instrument level. The validity of credit enhancements, such as financial guarantees, may also be impacted um, by the invasion. And let's move on to the last topic I wanted to cover today, and that's exchange rates. Now, exchange rates are also an important consideration. IS-21 um, requires the use of closing rates. So in determining whether a rate is a closing rate, an entity should consider whether currency is obtainable at an official quoted rate and whether the quoted rate is available for immediate delivery. The Russian Central Bank is still publishing its official rate on a regular basis. However, based on all the restrictions, it is known that rubles are now no longer being exchanged into other currencies under normal conditions. Now, taking into consideration that it is becoming increasingly difficult to exchange rubles to and from other currencies and that other official rates are no longer available, for example, rates from the ECB or the US um, Central Bank or Federal Reserves, it is now useful to benchmark the official rate published by the Russian Central Bank against other observable rates, which would indicate the, the rate at which entities outside of Russia may actually be exchanging rubles into other currencies. From a financial reporting perspective, we're pleased that our in-depth on accounting for green and renewable power purchase agreements from the buyer's perspective has been published and is currently available on Viewpoint. As entities plan to reduce their carbon footprint, they're often seeking to use green or sustainable electricity. And electricity is a unique product because it's not easily storable at scale. And often entities are connected to the electricity grid rather than being directly connected to generators. The connection to the grid means that electricity generated from sustainable sources is mixed with conventional electricity, and the resulting electricity itself does not have distinguishable characteristics based on its source. The uniqueness of the electricity market and the agreements that the entities are entering into to use green or sustainable electricity give rise to a number of complex accounting issues. And the in-depth discusses some common issues encountered by energy consumers, which are using these agreements as part of their sustainability strategy. You can also refer to our December 2021 IFRS technical video update, which is available on YouTube, where I discuss this topic in more detail. Okay, well, let's move on to an overview of the latest ESG reporting developments. And ESG, as many of you know, stands for Environmental, Social, and Governance. And it's been receiving increased attention over the past couple of years. It's a clear focus area for many stakeholders, particularly investors and regulators. And it's also an area which is changing rapidly, and therefore it's important for us to be aware of developments in this space um, to understand how ESG can impact business and reporting requirements. ESG factors can represent both risks and opportunities that will impact a company's ability to create long-term value. If we look at the E space, uh, some of the risks include environmental issues like climate change and natural resource scarcity, but those risks can also represent opportunities for others that are selling greener products, for example. So um, if you looked at a manufacturer of wind farm equipment, for example. The S covers social issues like labor practices, product safety, and data security. And the G covers governance matters, for example, board diversity, executive pay, and tax transparency. The latest developments in ESG reporting include new exposure drafts from the ISSB, the International Sustainability Standards Board, which is part of the IFRS Foundation, and uh, FREG, the European Financial Reporting Advisory Group, as well as proposed climate reporting rules from the United States uh, Securities and Exchange Commission, or SEC, to enhance and standardize the non-financial reporting disclosures for investors. The ISSB and FREG proposals are more focused on the broad spectrum across ESNG, whereas the U US proposals are currently more focused on uh, climate uh, exclusively. Um, International, the, let's look at the International Sustainability Standards Board or ISSB uh, proposals. Well, the intent here uh, of the ISSB is to form a global uh, comprehensive baseline for sustainability reporting standards with an enterprise value driven materiality approach. And the standards would be organized as general requirements and thematic standards, as well as industry specific metrics based on the SASBs or Sustainability Accounting Standards Boards. Uh, 77 industries. 
And they've currently published two exposure drafts, uh, S1, which is the general requirements of sustainability related financial information, and S2, the first of the thematic standards, which deals with climate related disclosures and largely draws upon the framework established by the TCFD. Um, as mentioned, the general requirements go beyond climate into other ES and G areas, although the ISSB will continue to issue more specific thematic standards on these topics going forward. The U.S. Uh, Securities and Exchange Commission, or SEC, um, as I mentioned, their rules uh, or proposed rules are currently more uh, narrowly focused on climate risk and opportunities, uh, but they do cover both financial and non-financial reporting requirements. So as those rules are proposed, they would require a footnote within the financial statements under both IFRS and U.S. GAAP for entities filing with the SEC. And among other things, uh, complying with these rules would require a registrant to identify severe weather events, transition activities, climate related risk, and determine the impact of these items on individual financial statement line items at a threshold of 1% of the impacted line item. It would also require reporting of scope 1% and two emissions and scope three emissions for most entities if material or if the entity is disclosing targets, including scope three emissions. The SEC also proposes required third party assurance on the non-financial reporting requirements, uh, such as emissions quantities. Um, and uh, as mentioned, there would also be the financial reporting requirements, which would be included in the financial statements um, as well. There is a proposed phased approach to transition depending on the registrant type. Uh, so the largest companies could be required to comply as early as for 2023 year ends as proposed. Um, if we turn to EFRAG, the European Financial Reporting Advisory Group, they're currently proposing 13 standards. Uh, the exposure drafts issued cover the general hierarchy and each of the environmental, social, and governance topics, as well as general concepts such as broader materiality, going beyond enterprise value, and boundary. Boundary uh, being sort of the scope of entities that would be included in the, in the reporting. Uh, the industry sector classification that they use is based on 40 sectors and 14 subsectors uh, with further industry development or disclosure requirements expected to be developed over time. And applying to all, this applies to all companies within the scope of the CSRD or Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive with financial years starting on or after the 1st of January, 2023. Although based on the current ongoing trilogue negotiations between the European Commission, the European Parliament and the Council of the EU, uh, it looks like there's broad support for at least a one year postponement. There's a lot happening concurrently, as you can see from this slide. So starting from the earliest due dates, you can see that the SEC released their rules or proposed rules on the 21st of March of 2022. And the comment period has now been extended until the 17th of June of 2022. So their comments are due first. The ISSB, on the other hand, released their uh, exposure drafts on the 31st of March, and they have a 120 day comment period with a deadline of the 29th of July of 2022. And then FRAG, the European Financial Reporting Advisory Group, their 13 exposure drafts were issued on the 30th of April 2022, and they have a 100 day comment period with a deadline of the 8th of August 2022. So um, a lot of uh, responses for companies to get through. People often ask, what is PwC doing in response to all of these exposure drafts? Well, as a network of firms with global reach, we're collaborating across the world to formulate meaningful responses to these exposure drafts. And I think we definitely have strong support for global alignment. I think, however, it's also very important for the standard setters to hear from preparers and other stakeholders. So we would definitely encourage you to respond and have your voice heard. There is an extensive number of questions raised in each of the requests for comment or exposure draft, as you know, but you can pick and choose what to respond to. So don't feel that you have to answer every question. And I think there are certain higher priority areas where the baseline frameworks might be aligned while recognizing some standard setters may still want to go beyond the baseline, but things like the structure of the standards, materiality, um, how the reporting entity is defined, so the boundary, how scenario analysis is, is used, and key metrics and targets.
For the ISSB response, we're still formulating it, of course, but a few items that we've focused on to date include the application of a management lens to understand what should re be reported and how to encourage reciprocity and accepting ISSB standards by jurisdictional uh, standard setters and regulators. We also think boundary will be an important consideration, including how information relating to associates and joint ventures is included. The standards require thinking broadly about the value chain upstream and downstream and understanding what is material in that value chain will also be critical. There are questions about the complexity of scenario analysis, uh, whether it needs to be disclosed uh, and the scenarios that need to be taken into consideration. So that might be an area that you also want to focus on. Um, different frameworks all need different disclosures when it comes to industries. Uh, so what's the correct level of disclosure for industries would also be another question. Obviously, there are a lot of different areas to think about in relation to the ISSB proposals, and we can't go through them in a lot of detail today. And as I mentioned, we're still working on our views on the proposals, but hopefully this gives a bit of an idea of some things we're thinking about. And at the end of the webcast, the PwC resources slide contains our current thought leadership covering the exposure drafts in more detail and the proposed rules discussed. Uh, for all of the ISSB, SEC, and FRAG proposals. And I wanted to, of course, reiterate that sustainability reporting is rapidly evolving, and therefore, watch out for the latest updates. In this last section, I'll provide you with an update of some of the things happening in standard setting. We'll look at the recent agenda and tentative agenda decisions of the Interpretations Committee, and share the developments relating to the disclosure of non-current liabilities with covenants being discussed by the ISB. In April 2022, the Interpretations Committee finalised the agenda decision on demand deposits with third party restrictions. The decision confirms the presentation of demand deposits as cash and cash equivalents. A little detail about the request might help you. The following fact pattern was provided. An entity holds a demand deposit. The terms and the conditions of the deposit do not prevent the entity from accessing the amounts held in it. The entity also has a contractual obligation with a third party to keep a specified amount of cash in the separate demand deposit and to use the cash only for the specified purpose. If the entity requested any amount from the deposit, it would receive that amount on demand. However, if the entity used the amounts held in the demand deposit for purposes other than those agreed with the third party, it would be in breach of its contractual obligations. The committee determined that the restrictions on the use of the demand deposit arising from the contract with the third party do not result in the deposit no longer being cash, unless those restrictions change the nature of the deposit in a way that it would no longer meet the definition of cash in IAS 7. The entity should include the demand deposit as cash and cash equivalents in the statement of cash flows. The entity should present the demand deposits in the ca as cash and cash equivalents also in the statement of financial position. Where useful to the user's understanding of the financial position, the entity should disaggregate the cash and cash equivalents line item and present the demand deposit subject to restrictions separately. The entity should also explain what the restriction on the demand deposit was. In November 2021, the ISB proposed amendments to IAS 1 presentation of financial statements to improve the information that companies provide about long-term debt with covenants. The ISB issued the ED because of the feedback that they had received on amendments that were made to IAS 1 on current and non-current presentation back in 2020 that were not yet applicable. The proposed changes could significantly impact the presentation of borrowings in entities' financial statements. The new ED proposes amendments to classification, presentation and disclosure. These amendments are aimed to remove the concerns that were raised with the 2020 guidance. In 2020, the guidance required the classification of a liability as current even when at the reporting date, there was no contractual obligation to repay the liability within 12 months. To make this clear, let's consider the following example. A company with a junior end has a, repayable, a loan repayable in five years time. The loan includes a covenant requiring a working capital ratio above one at the 31st of December at the end of that year. The loan becomes repayable on demand if the ratio is not met at the specified date. It's now May, and the company is thinking of its 30 June reporting. The company's working capital ratio is 0 
management expects to meet the minimum working capital ratio by the 31st of December at the end of the year. According to the 2020 amendments, for the purposes of classifying the liability as current or non-current, the company should assess if it would have complied with this covenant based on its circumstances as at 30 June. It assesses compliance at 30th of June 2022, even though compliance is only required at the 31st of December, the end of the year. So in this example, the loan would have been classified as current in the June financial reporting. The 2021 ED requires a company to classify liabilities as current or non-current based on the covenants that require compliance on or before the reporting date. So in the example that we've just discussed, the loan is classified as non-current at the 30th of June, according to the 2021 ED. A significant change that is proposed to the presentation is that in the ED, non-current liabilities that are subject to covenants within 12 months after the reporting date are presented separately on the face of the statement of financial position. This would be a significant change if that is in the final standard. And lastly, the ED proposes disclosures that enables investors to assess the risk that liabilities could become repayable within 12 months. Additional guidance provides clarification of when a company does not have the right to defer settlement for 12 months from balance sheet date. The board also proposes retrospective application and defer the effective date of the 2020 amendments to the 1st of January, 2024. ED, Feedback is expected in June 22. This is a tentative agenda decision when we recorded this. The decision is likely to be finalised at the IFRIC meeting in June. We are sharing this now because it may be relevant to you before our next webcast. In November 2021, the IFRIC discussed a request dealing with the application of IS37 to measures taken by governments to promote energy efficiency and to reduce carbon emissions. In the example provided, under the government measures, entities receive positive credits if in a calendar year they produce or import vehicles whose average emissions lower than the target set by the government. And the company receives negative credits if they produce or imported vehicles in excess of the target. An entity that receives negative credits for the year is required to eliminate those negative credits either by purchasing positive credits from another entity or by generating the credits itself in the following year. If the entity fails to eliminate its negative credits, the government can impose sanctions on the entity and the sanctions may include restricting the entity's access to the market in the future. The question is whether an entity that has agreed to negative credit, that has generated negative credits, has a present obligation that meets the definition of a liability in IAS 37. In the tentative agenda decision, the committee concluded that an entity that receives negative credits for the year has a legal obligation that meets the definition of a liability in IAS 37, unless accepting government sanctions is a realistic alternative. For an entity that does not have a legal obligation, because accepting sanctions is a realistic alternative, it could have a constructive obligation if it has taken an action that has created a valid expectation in other parties that it will eliminate its negative credits. The committee's reasoning was that the measures that create the obligation and that give the government the authority to impose sanctions derive from an operation of law. The obligation arises from past events and exists independently of the entity's future actions, and an entity can settle its obligation either by purchasing positive credits from another entity that it uses to meet its obligation, or by generating positive credits itself in the next year to meet the current year obligation. In either case, settlement involves an outflow of economic benefits from the entity. This agenda decision will be discussed again in June, so look for the final decision. Okay, we've covered a lot of ground today, and we certainly hope that you found this webcast helpful. I also wanted to highlight where to go for additional resources. We recently published our Global IFRS June Year End Reminders. The document relates to reporting requirements as of June 30, 2022, but it also includes topical issues that entities may want to consider, as well as standards and interpretations that are newly applicable for June 30 year ends. Additionally, there is also a lot of information on the topics we discussed today in this webcast on our Viewpoint website. So thank you very much for listening to us today and happy accounting. Thank you.